Good morning, village. It's good to see you from a camera today. I miss you guys. Can't wait to be back in the house, worshiping with you. But for right now, welcome to my house. And uh, I hope you'll just come in and worship with me for a minute. And I'm going to do some old songs. You may have heard them, you may not have. They're some of my favorites. This one goes like this. So when I walked in the door, I sensed his presence. was a place where love abounds for this is a temple Jehovah God abides here and we are standing
holy ground you know that every place your foot stands every place your foot walks is holy ground because he lives in you and there's no place that you can go that you're not on holy ground because the spirit of the Lord God lives in you and you're standing in his presence Standing in your presence on holy ground, and there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all. Turn it to go and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else could touch my heart like you.
there is none like you. Oh, your precious Lord, there's none like you. There is none like you. Well, good morning, Village Church. I am honored that you have chosen to tune in today. We have a special conversation I'm so excited about. And I know when I say Village Church, not only is it uh, those individuals that consider themselves a part of the Village family, but it also uh, represents people all over the country and even all over the world who are a part of our Everybody Church family. And some of you, you just stumbled upon the conversation and we are so honored that you are here and we hope it'll be a profitable time that you'll feel really good about. We're in the middle of a series called Conversations. Uh, I learned a long time ago that some of the my greatest teaching moments for me, the times that I have learned the best, have been times when I've just been in conversation with someone and they have said something that has stretched me, uh, caused me to grow. And so over the last few weeks, we have had some wonderful conversations and today is going to be just as rich, just as wonderful, because today my guest is Alejandro Ugarte, who is a part of our village family and truly one of the most unique individuals I have ever met. Alejandro, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks to you, Ray, for having me. I appreciate it. Listen, I miss you. I have seen you through this uh, pandemic. I've seen you a couple of times at the church when you and Matthew and the team have gotten together to do some socially distant music, but I have missed you because you used to come to our house and we'd have get togethers and parties and uh, I'm ready for this thing to get over. How about you? Oh my gosh, me too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it cannot be over soon enough. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree. Thank you, by the way, for sitting down for this interview, from the moment I met you, I've known that we needed to have this conversation. And uh, I just appreciate you opening yourself up and being willing to do this. Thank you, my friend, very, very much. My pleasure. Hey, as we begin, I just want to get a little background. Um, I know these things, but I just want everybody else to know you work for Goodwill of North Georgia. You're a senior director of corporate compliance and their diversity officer. So you're busy during the week doing your thing, and that's wonderful. Obviously, people can tell just by your voice, you weren't born in South Georgia. You were born, tell us where you were born. So I was born in uh, Valencia, which is in Venezuela in the very north. It is the third la largest city uh, there in Venezuela. Oh it's my It's in goodness. South America. You, are, do you speak any other languages besides Spanish and English? Do you have any third or fourth um, languages? I do. Um, I speak some Italian and uh. some French. Uh, and make, uh, I'm fluent in those, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's hardly ever do I get to speak uh, those languages or practice them. So when I find somebody, I kind of corner, corner them and try to practice as much as I can. <laughs> so it's not perfect. That That is amazing. You That just sounds so beyond anything I can even imagine, but I'm just, I'm so impressed. I love that. I want to get around to this in a moment. When I first met you, I realized you had one of the greatest gifts of connecting people I had ever seen in my life. I had never, you know, I, I consider myself talented in some areas and a pretty good um, connector myself, but you just have a way of knowing people and plugging people together. And so and it's, this is a crazy question. Has that always, have you always known that's kind of a gift of yours? Not really. Um, I think um, I've done it for throughout all my life, but I guess I was not aware of it. You, I've never seen, I mean, I just, I just see the way you have connected me to people, the way you've connected people to our church. And I just think you, I don't even know what it is. It's like a spiritual gift or something, but you have it in in a way that I have never seen. So anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge that before we got deeper well, into our discussion. 
And uh, so Matthew sometimes says, oh, my goodness, you know people everywhere. You just right. lift up a rock and you know people there. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. I've, I've never seen anything like it. Um, I want to get a little bit of your background because even though I feel like I know you well and I love you as a brother, I don't really know that much about your story. So take us back. You live, When did you move here from Venezuela? I moved to the U.S. in 2006. I was around 21 years old, I think. Yeah, something like that. I think I was 21. So 21 years of your life, it does. 21 years of your life, you live in Venezuela and that is that is your home. What did what did your family do? Were you uh, uh, in a big city? Were you suburbanites? Uh, what was it like in Venezuela? Yeah, um, I growing up in Valencia, Venezuela, which is the third largest city. Um, I would say Valencia has a lot of things that remind me of uh, Atlanta. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Venezuela has changed a lot throughout the years. And because of that, I haven't been able to, I visited a couple of times, but then the last time I visited was in 2010. And it has changed a lot, so I haven't been able to visit since then. Um, I wish that I had actually, I've, I've only spent one night in Venezuela and I was in Caracas. And oh I, was actually, yeah. I was actually frightened during the time I was there. It just felt like y'all were right on the brink of war. It felt like it was very, tense to me. I don't and know. What, what year was that? I am thinking it would have been uh, maybe the late 90s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if it was, um, if it felt different, it was probably the end of the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Just it I remember a... I slept with one eye open the whole night and the, the hotel that we stayed in, um, they had to open a gate and we had to go drive in and they shut the gate real fast. It just felt like yeah. there's a lot going on in Venezuela right now. Well, and Caracas is used to be called, I don't know anymore because I haven't been, it used to be called the New York of South America because it's, it's overpopulated. It's like uh, New York, Caracas, Rio de Janeiro. There are cities that are oh, yes. extremely overpopulated. Yes. So. so let me ask you this. So you're growing up in Venezuela um, church, was your family evangelical? Were you Catholic? How, what was your early religious background? Venezuela is a country that is, or back then used to be, when I was growing up, 90-something uh, percent Catholic. However, my father was a non-practicing Catholic growing up, and my mother was a Christian, but she was not practicing because right. the church that she grew up with was very patriarchal, very legalistic and she was already uh it just the aligned with um you know what she was learning in college and as a professional and then she started her business and whatnot so my perception as a child as i grew up was that i was the first christian in my family because oh. at the moment nobody had anything to do uh with christianity and uh so i found a little new testament in my house that was highlighted and written on and I I was an avid reader a reader as a kid so I started reading through it and I came to Romans 10 9 and 10 uh, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe it in your heart and that was for me enough for uh, oh goodness. to make my decision of faith That's uh, and I told my grandpa yeah and I told my grandpa and he was the one that discipled me my goodness so your grandfather had a background so he discipled you but you basically just reading the Bible came to a place of faith. That's beautiful. Now then, were you instrumental in your family? Did they become followers of Jesus as well? Yes. I started doing mission work uh, when I was a teenager because I was translating for some of the Americans that were coming into, the, into Venezuela uh, to do mission work. And um, I knew English already. And so I was uh, around the age of 14 uh, and I had this conversation with my mother where I said, I know you've been a Christian before and how um, how is it that I'm the only one that is going to church and you're not going and whatnot. So I went to a mission trip. And the thing is that I was very skeptical about uh, most everything. I don't, I don't even know how I was even a believer uh, because I understood what they were praying in tongues. So when I came out of that church with my peers, um, missionaries and translators, 
I told them, oh my gosh, that woman was praying all this crazy stuff over us in the future. And they looked at me and they were like, you were actually understanding what they were saying in tongues. Nobody oh else understood. Goodness. So, oh my goodness. and one of those things that she prayed was, when you get home, you will have two happiness. And those two happiness were my mother was attending church and my sister um, had a nightmare and she came upstairs where my room was and she asked if she could sleep with me in the bed because she was afraid and we were both young. And then following morning, she asked about what I did in the, you know, while I was away in missions. And that's how she came to Christ oh my uh, that goodness. following day. That is so, exciting. <laughs> that is exciting. Talk, so, talk about skepticism. Yeah. It, it just all fell away. You know what is amazing? I have been that preacher in those little cities and little towns where I've got a 13 or 14 year old translator and it's just bringing back all these memories to me thinking that there might be, you know, some of those young guys that translated for me back in Eastern Europe, all the places that I've been, South America, that um, it just, it just, I haven't thought about that, that it's, it, it, that's how you started, that you were just right there beside the preacher translating the sermons as a young person and then uh, were instrumental in your family coming to faith. Now, have the, did the whole family come to the States? Did everybody come or just you? Uh, no, initially it was just me. Um, as soon as I graduated college, uh, I moved to the U.S. Uh, my family didn't come until many, many years later, about a decade later. What was making you want to move to the States? What was it that drew you here? Well, at the beginning, I was just exploring, uh, especially because I graduated. I was young. Um, and it was super easy for Venezuelans back then to come to the U.S. to visit, to uh, just basically uh, go around and whatnot. Venezuela had a good had good standing with the, with the U.S. Right. back then because of right. the economy. Uh, it used to be the large, the richest country in South America and whatnot. So it was totally different back then. It was not what it is today. Huh. So it was a lot of curiosity. Uh, curiosity tends to be what drives me a lot. Oh, so, I bet. I, yeah. I understand. I understand. <laughs> So, so you are this devoted follower of Jesus who takes it very seriously and even to the point of, of concern for your family and helping them find the Lord. And yet at some point you discover you're gay. How, how did that work for you? I'm going to answer that in two parts uh, about being gay and about how early did I uh, realize right. uh, about myself. Um, right. So to begin with, since, uh, well, I identify as bi, bisexual. Um, one of the things that I have learned is that most people, for most people, it is, it is really difficult to understand what bisexuality is. And that's mostly because for a lot of people, it is a lot easier to come out first as bisexual right. than gay because right. it diminishes the impact or perhaps some associate being gay with uh, being f too feminine. So right. it diminishes the negativity of it that some people think it could have. Um, so for many reasons, um, in my case, it would have been a lot easier to just come out as gay because I don't have to do a whole lot of explaining. A friend of mine who is a pastor, her name is Elle Dow, and she once said something, she's also bisexual, and she said something that, that impacted me. She said that for bisexual people, we're always going to be pushed into one closet or another. If you are in a mixed orientation relationship with a person of the opposite gender, then people will just say that you just like your cake and eat it too. Right. Uh, or that you are in the down low or something like that. It, it's hardly ever acknowledged that your orientation is bisexual right. um, and if you are in a relationship with the same gender then people might say oh you're just gay and you don't want to accept it you don't you know you're ashamed of it or, or something being bi does not make me uh, more manly or less than any of my gay uh, friends you know or siblings uh, I'm just as equal as them I like men just as much as them I just happen to 
also have an inclination towards women. Um, and I would say that bisexuality on, of, on itself is on a spectrum because in my own experience, and I can only speak for myself, I my romantic layer or side or whatever that is, is usually more towards guys. Right. And the physical part is more attractive to me towards women, but because the best outcome for me is usually I'm the happiest when my romantic, when my emotional side is fulfilled, then I think like the last few relationships have, have been mostly with guys. And that's how I've come to understand myself. There was a time when I, I would just say that I'm gay because that was easier. I didn't have to explain anything. And so some of the people that were closest to me held me accountable and said, hey, have you ever heard of Bio Razor? You're not helping and uh, you're not being brave. You're just, you know, going no, with I, and I appreciate easiest. I appreciate your bravery and I appreciate that I don't have to understand it perfectly. I, I, it always made sense to me, the spectrum idea and the idea that someone could be way to the one side on heterosexual or way to one side on homosexual. And then there were those individuals that were closer to the center on the spectrum where they could feel that kind of an orientation, love or whatever to either male or female. I, I, but I'm sure I'm not understanding it exactly. What I love about our church and what I love about this life that I live is I get to learn from people like you and that's a beautiful thing. And how you are living it out is teaching me and it's making my life better. And I appreciate that very much, very, very much. Did you know as a young person that you were feeling these things? I knew as a very young kid that I was attracted to both, but I was in denial. I uh, Now that I've had a lifetime to meditate and reflect on it and search through my memories, I remember clearly how I had a crush on one of my little uh, girl neighbors uh, that to this day she's a great friend, uh, but then I would see other guys and I would have a crush on them too. Right. And then years later, the same thing would happen and throughout my entire life, but I denied that side of me. Um, and then went, in, went into a relationship that lasted a few years with a female, but I was not honest. And I would also say that you have to be honest in order to be bi because it ends up hurting yourself and it ends up hurting the other person. I, I understand uh, that, I bet. At the end of that relationship, I went, uh, I sought out counseling and therapy, and I did two years of therapy for unwanted same sex attraction, which I thought that's what it was at the moment. Oh, so um, you were you were in that so, whole idea, I've got to get fixed. I got to get this gay out of me. Yes. I understand. Yes. Okay. So I, in my mind, I was like, I either need to be just gay or need to be straight, but I have these two things in my mind. And I need to get rid of one of the two. And of course, it has to be getting rid of the unwanted same-sex attraction. Right, right. Um, so I did therapy for two years. If that had been college, I would have aced uh, therapy. It was residential. And so I lived there for two years. On the first year, I remember I read about, uh, I read 22 books. Everything I could find and that they could recommend that was in their library about unwanted same-sex attraction. The following year, I read a little bit more than that. Um, I did everything that was asked of me. I prayed, I fasted. Um, pretty much a lot of the same tenets that are known as reparative therapy. Uh, Can I ask you course, something? Were you, a, were you here when you were doing sure. this? Was this in the States, right? This was in the States? Yes. Oh, after, it sounds like a grueling process. It sounds like it was like going to reparative therapy. I mean, they were you were doing every jumping through every hoop you could jump through to try to get the gay out. Yes, True. big time. Uh, I wanted to get rid of that at that time. I wanted to get rid of that unwanted same-sex attraction. So I, anyhow, it wasn't until I ended therapy uh, two years later that I, I I had a lot of questions uh, to God. I had so many questions that I needed God to answer, and that is what actually led me to come to terms with it. With so I want I people to hear that you are, you are praying, you're doing all of the work 
and you still have this relationship with God because a lot of people think, well, you can't, there's no way. If, he, if he's gay, if he's, tra- if he's that's that can't, but you were wrestling with something that you didn't ask for and your relationship with God, you, you end up saying, I've got a lot of questions. I've got to ask the Lord because this is not, it's, I'm not changing. This is who I, I am, I guess. Yeah, I had a, like I said, I had a ton of questions. And because of the therapy in which I was, which was, I had a good discipline of reading my Bible every day and whatnot. And I had questions that just were not being answered. And then after about a year of silence after therapy, a year of silence from God, where he, she, it, they did not answer those questions. Finally, it started, I started getting answers through the Bible itself, but they were not answers to the questions I was asking, but rather answers to my heart. Uh, And it was weird. It felt like God was answering to something and or as if I had not been asking the right questions. I got to Judges 19 and I noticed the correlation with the so famous story of Sodom, which I had been taught was a story about homosexuality. Right. Um, But in Judges 19, it is pretty much the same story, but it was a woman. And I was baffled because I had read through the Bible a couple of times in my life, but I had not paid attention to the fact that it was pretty much the same story, but, but a woman. As I noticed that and I started going back to Genesis 19, I also noticed that Genesis 18, which is the chapter prior to that, was an example of the opposite. So then it was a period of wrestling with those two passages, like what is going on here? What's going on? Like it doesn't sit well with me and what I've been taught. Uh, it was long periods of silence and pause um, in my, re- you know, I continued reading, but the questions were, were in my mind. And then in Venezuela, there was a lot of turmoil and the National Guard and, uh, or the police were apprehending protesters against the government and raping them sexually or with the long guns. And I immediately started thinking of uh, Sodom. And I was like, I started praying, God, what are you going to do with my country, Venezuela? Are you going to judge Venezuela like Sodom? Are you going to destroy Venezuela? And I was just praying that every day because my family lived there and my friends and everybody I loved. And I was just scared for what was going to happen there. And because that's what I had been taught. I kept asking the same question on and on and on. At some point, finally, I started seeing comments about Venezuela and it was not being addressed as crimes of homosexuality, but it was being addressed as crimes against humanity. Alejandro, those are crimes against humanity. Those are done to humiliate people. And I started learning how the same had been done in many different wars. And like societies like Japan had used the same technique to humiliate opponents. Then I was like, well, Am I the only one that is thinking or viewing this passage so weird? So I started looking up, you know, comments about what was going on in Venezuela and Sodom and whatnot. And I saw that other people thought the same way I was thinking, Uh that it was not about homosexuality. It was more like, you know, a crime of uh, uh, against humanity, against hospitality. So then I kept going through my reading and I... As I start looking at other people and start making connections, then I heard somebody talk about the Ethiopian eunuch um, Mm -hmm. in a queer perspective that uh, the Bible says he was on his way to worship. And Deuteronomy 23.1 says that no man without testicles could could join the congregation. So in my mind, I was like, oh, if he was under the law and practicing the law and he was on his way to worship, he must have had testicles. And then that tied up with uh, Matthew 19, where Jesus says that there are three kinds of eunuchs. So I was right. like, okay, so if he had testicles and people didn't know about orientation back then, didn't know about anatomy to fully understand um, intersex, which is the other possibility, he could have been intersex. But then I was like, well, but then that would have been considered a normality. And the Bible also says people with abnormalities would have not joined the congregation. So it's like, oh my gosh. And so that just started creating more and more questions. And 
I became more hungry to just look at the past. You really, you really came at yeah. this through a very intellectual mind. That's, I love the way these things were fitting together for you. That's because those are things that I studied later in a textbook kind of a way, but it's just kind of coming to you, just reading the Bible and it's beginning to make sense. I love that. I love yes. that you were able to get it. But then after that, that's how I started finding names like Kathy Baldock, uh, Justin Lee, Matthew Vines. And then I started reading their books. Um, I found a local LGBT Christian group uh, at the time called Affinity Atlanta that I joined and then became part of and helped uh, lead and whatnot. And also some national groups like QCF and TRP itself. Um, and that started helping me learn a little bit more because, uh, of course, I could only read so much on my own. There already were people with theological degrees studying and looking at the same thing. But it was God himself through the Bible that started speaking to my heart. Now, was it, it difficult? It, it was, was it difficult for you to come out to your family? Was that was that a difficult season for you? Is that something that's been a process a long time? Did you do it early? Did you wait and do it later? When I talk about coming out, I see it in different stages for my experience. 2009, that relationship that I was in uh, with that girl uh, for several years crashed because she learned about my orientation. And of course it crashed the relationship. So at that point I told my parents, but I told them, well, don't worry because I'm about to go into this therapy this fixed, that I found right. and I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be fixed. So that was the first time that was in 2009. In 2012, I came out to myself after I had done two years of therapy and I did everything I could. Um, oh, I bet. It just bet. didn't work. It was just a moment. I had my first, I met the first boyfriend that I ever had. Uh, and of course, I had to come uh, to terms with myself that it had not, that therapy had not worked. They had taught me that passage of 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that talks about bringing all thoughts captive to right. the presence of Christ. Right. But it was an all, all day thing. Uh, you know, most thoughts like, oh God, I'm having this thought and I'm bringing it to you and whatnot. Right, right. And I started asking, you know, a lot of the questions that I had at the moment were like, God, is this how I'm going to live all my life? But the Bible says, talks about abundant life, and I'm doing this to live more wholesome and not be a broken person. This doesn't feel like that. It's It feels quite the opposite. I'd rather be asleep all day long, every day of my life, so I don't have to like be doing all of this every day. Yes. This is tiring. And I was asking God, how much longer am I going to have to do this? If the two years with like the counselors and therapists right there didn't cure me, what else is gonna do it? How much long? How much long? I had I had so many questions. I can tell you're ridiculous. cerebral. I can see how your mind just works. And yes, uh, my mind works with curiosity and questions. I I'm always asking questions. Yeah. My goodness. When my parents moved a couple of years later to the U.S. because the situation in Venezuela just got horrible. The first thing I did when they moved here was, hey, by the way, uh, the therapy I went into did not work. And I've come to understand that God loves me just as I am, and there's nothing for me to have to change. And that was devastating news to them. And their reaction was, well, we know that you're bi, so there's still hope because there's that little side of you, which is another right. misconception about bi people, you know? Uh, that little side of you that is by that likes women, we're gonna pray to God for a miracle to change right, you. Right, that's still and normal. Like, that's normal, yeah. So I was like, listen, if I, who I am in my own mind and flesh and body, wanted it more than anybody and prayed and went and did therapy and, and fasted, didn't accomplish it, I doubt that your prayers will do it, but go ahead and be my guest. So that was pretty much my answer. So 2015 was when I came out to them. And I told them, I'm, I'm going to live and be happy. And um, so it's taken them a few years, but they've also, for the most part, come around. I don't know. I don't think they're still praying. Thankfully, they've, you know, they've met my boyfriend now, Matthew, and we've spent a lot of time together and visited together. So uh, it's been very good in the last in the last few years. You know what? I'm old enough to be your father. And uh, 
when I see you and Matthew, I see two of the finest Christian men that I have ever met. And I love your relationship. I love that I get to be a part of the family. And uh, I'm just so proud of you, the way that you processed it, the way you did it. It's not the same way everybody else can do it because you you have an unusual brain. The way your brain works is is quite unusual, I think. But you you did it. And then you just didn't do it. You then have been helping rescue people along the way. And I think that is beautiful. You, you are, you're always looking to try to connect people that maybe are where you were 10 years ago, I guess. I guess you're, you're thinking I can save them so a lot of heartbreak and I can help them. And that's what I mean when I started by talking about you as a great connector. Well, I can't even go into all the people that you've connected me with, but they were just incredible people. And it was you who knew their story and knew that we would, it would be good for us to get to meet. So I'm just kind of in awe of you, Alejandro. I just want you to know you're one of my heroes. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I tend to be very passionate about most everything in my life. And um, the way that God herself himself, and I'm sorry, I use several pronouns, but I think Right now in my walk with God and where I am in life, I think I've learned that I just, it's impossible to box God. Um, but anyhow, I've learned that there are many other people that also are looking for understanding uh, and that sometimes they suffer the misunderstanding and the ignorance from people in our churches and it hurts really deeply and I've been there I've had those feelings of not wanting to be awake uh, if you know what I mean right. just because of thinking that God doesn't want you or that there's it doesn't matter what you do you will never accomplish being what God wants you to do uh, and then coming to understand that God loves me deeply just as I am and that there is nothing I have to change and I saw that in the example of the eunuch. I saw that the eunuch was the, a person whose uh, orientation and sexual identity was questionable. And yet we see no historical registry in the Bible of him being required to change at I love all. That. I and love that, that was so that. Ap that was applicable to me. And I was like, that is applicable to every single person that is part of the LGBTQI umbrella. And unless there are more people that learn this, which not everybody has the time to just dig, then it, yeah, we're just losing lives. I've seen, I've had friends that have taken their lives because of this and it's just yes. not fair. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I, you've preached a sermon today, my friend. If anybody was listening closely, what you said has been so important. It's a beautiful understanding of scripture and I see you as someone who is free. And it took you a while to get to that freedom of understanding it and understanding that uh, you didn't have to change your orientation. This was who you were. And you were learning how mm -hmm. to live it out beautifully. And uh, I'm so proud. I'm so proud to get to know you. Listen, this has been a great conversation. Um, would you do me a favor? Would you just look right into your camera, right into people's hearts right now? Would you just say a prayer for anyone who maybe is out there hurting right now and doesn't know if they um, can actually love God and be accepted by God because of their orientation. Would you do that? And then let me just say a closing word. Absolutely. God, I come to you right now and I want to lift up every single person that feels different because of their sexual identity or their orientation. And I want to ask you to place the, that person in their path or that resource or that video podcast that lets them know that you love them as queer as they are because you created them, that you love them as gay, as transgender, lesbian, anything, any identity that they are because you are a God who has not stopped creating and you are mighty and sovereign. 
Thank you, God, for creating us all different and unique and that we can walk this world as we are. And please be alongside them and place the right person resource that can help them know that you love them deeply. And I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love that, Alejandro. And I pray that if you were watching, that maybe something register with your heart and you'll find him. You'll find him. We'll put some information on the screen, how you can get in touch with him. Get in touch with me, Ray at raywaters.com, the Village Church, Everybody Church. We want you to know that uh, you're, you're okay. God loves you just like you are. God loves you. Alejandro, I love you, my friend. And I love Matthew. And I can't wait till we all can get together. Thank you, my friend. And for everybody who's watched today, thank you. Blessings to you. I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful week. Likewise. Bye.